Any questions? Any kind of question? Most people here already have been sitting one month or one week or one day. <laughs> yes, Sam. Uh, I was wondering about sutras and um, the function of learning the sutras and also is it necessary or when does it become necessary to learn them? When, uh, when I first came to the Zen Center, uh, Sung San Sin told us, don't read. Even, uh, I came in 77, and they had, uh, he had been uh, in America, I think about less than five years, and uh, his students had gathered together a bunch of his talks that they had recorded and prepared this book, Dropping Ashes on the Buddha, before I came. And I didn't even read that. He said, don't read. Of course, I thought, I've got this living guy right in front of me. What do I need to read a book? And about 20 years later, he told me, oh, sometime you read a sutra is good. And then when I read the sutra, I could understand it really quite easily from personal experience. If there was some line that I wasn't sure about or some question, I'd mark it and I'd ask him. Nowadays, if I come across something that's really kind of curious, um, most of the English language uh, sutras, at least the ones that I have, or uh, I read sometimes the old Zen masters. I like to read original stuff. Um, it comes from Chinese. So I can mark the English and ask Hyung Gong Sanim or some of our Chinese nuns in Hong Kong or Malaysia, oh, what's the Chinese of this English words? And then they'll tell me, they'll find it, and they'll, you know, usually translation's difficult because you can't often just one word for one word. It has its own range of meanings. And uh, they'll sort of describe that, oh, I get a deeper sense. But actually, um, hey, Walsenim, Su Walsenim, they couldn't read. They never studied the sutras, and they're two of the five Zen master disciples of Kyung Ho Sinim. So it's not necessary at all. Um, it's very valuable for any practicing person or any Buddhist to get a correct view. But you can get that through Dharma talks if you then apply it. Yeah, yesterday I did a talk in Seoul to uh, the Choge Order's uh, Lay People's Dharma Instructor Association, and I talked about, they asked, uh, I think the title was, what's the uh, attitude, what kind of attitude should a, a Buddhist have? You know? And I said, basically, it's how do you keep your mind moment to moment? But um, to fill it out more, rather than just giving a Zen-style talk, I said, correct view is very important, okay? And what's correct view in Buddhism? First three insights uh, that Buddha talked about is uh, impermanence. Everybody wants permanence. You know, on the social level, we want a, you know, a relationship that we can rely on forever. You know, that's a, a lot of, that's what causes so much heartache often, you know. You fall in love with somebody and it doesn't work. You know, I wanted to be able to rely on this person forever. Also, our own impermanence. We know, even though lots of times we don't believe it deep inside, we're going to die. This isn't permanent. Body's not permanent. Uh-oh, is, is the the one who's talking permanent. And then we make up these ideas about this permanent soul. We have to explain it to ourselves somehow. Well, if the body's not permanent and the thinking's not permanent, maybe there's something called a soul. And then we make up some story about where that comes from and what happens to the soul after you die, you know? So we want some kind, almost everybody wants some kind of permanence in life, but if if the truth of the world is impermanent, then it's not a very healthy attitude. And it leads to um, uh, problems and suffering. We suffer or we create suffering for others. 
The second insight is the insight into suffering. All things have suffering in the sense that everything that appears will disappear. Forms appear, differentiate, and then they disappear. Everything, every animal, every insect, you know, every plant, planets, suns, the whole universe seems to be like that. That it will appear, differentiate, and disappear. So that's also very shocking. If, but if you want a life, if you're always striving for comfort, you'll have a problem because the nature of existence has something a great deal of the time uncomfortable. Buddha said life is dukkha. Usually we translate dukkha as suffering, but it has kind of a more subtle meaning that means unreliable, you know, or unbalanced, imbalanced, or kind of falling apart. You know, the heart of every religion has, is coming from some truth, and, and when its basic teaching is, uh, you know, care about others, that's the truth, you know. And it appears in different forms according to culture. But in Buddhism, we say any uh, teaching is like a finger pointing to the moon. If you attach to the finger, you don't get the moon. So the sutras are also kind of finger. They're pointing. And too much understanding won't help you. You know, when we give, we teach this, this basic point, primary point, most Westerners can learn it really quickly because they have no teaching of Buddhism in their head. So when Sansini would say, you know, your true self is before speech. Show me your true self. And we'd be like, and then he'd say, you must try that. And we're like, no, you must hit. And then we'd hit and he'd go, wonderful, wonderful. And everybody was like, wow, great, you know? And then what is Buddha? What is mine? What is true? Now I ask you, what is Buddha? And you're like, Good. You know, I even tell people who are hesitant, you know, you already know how to get an A plus on this test. Just do it. But if people have checking, they can't do it. You know? And many ways to check. Oh, I want it to come from me. I want it, my style. You know, there's easy ways to get around that. You know. I just say, okay, you're learning to drive. The teacher sits there, you sit here. You know, we drive on the right side here. And the teacher says, put the key there. That's a gas, that's a brake, that's a clutch. This is the stick. Watch the stick, watch everything. You know, do this, do that. Nobody says, well, I want it to come from me. <laughs> you know, it's like, I want my style to appear. Just follow the teacher. You do it, do it, do it. Then it becomes yours. Then the teacher, you know how to drive. You can drive. Then the teacher's not necessary. Say, Kick out the teacher, take your car wherever you want to go. Sense the same. If you learn it and it becomes yours, you don't need the teacher, you don't need Buddha, you don't need Buddhism. You can find your way and help all beings. But uh, have to learn first. If you put too much stuff in your head, then very hard to learn by doing it. So when we give interviews sometimes to older Koreans, for example, who have studied lots of Buddhism, I start to explain the basics of primary point, and you can see after a short time their eyes go up, and they're comparing it to what they've read. <laughs> Finished. So what I notice with older Koreans who have studied a lot of Buddhism, don't give a long explanation. Go straight to a question. But with the younger people, usually, we can lay out an explanation, and they stick with it listening. And then they can do it or not do it according to how much they just have trust and do it or how much checking. But everybody, if they stick with it, can begin to get some confidence and just do it. So uh, the sutras are correct, but they're not necessary. They're like a map. Okay, they're all maps. How do you, what country you're from? Australia, right? And you live in Brisbane? Yeah, so the map shows you how to get over to Perth. 
But you can look at, you know, there's the small map and the big map and the superhighway map and the, the geographical map. I mean, I like looking at that stuff. Wow, look at that. There's like nothing in the middle of this continent. You know, <laughs> it's like Australia is like nothing, you know. And then there's stuff on the edges, you know. But you haven't gotten to Perth. Much better if somebody says, oh, go down this road, and you go down there, and then they say, okay, you're going the right way, continue over here, and you continue over there, and, and you get it step by step, and then you're in Perth, and you know Perth. Even if you have a city map of Perth and where everything is, you may memorize it perfectly. You don't know Perth, you haven't been there. So much better is do it, do it. These guys got enlightened without ever being able to read anything. And they became great teachers. And they, hey, Walsingham has great stories of literally standing up to Japanese generals until they respected him. You know, so that's serious stuff. That's not neurotic people from a comfortable country that, of course, has problems. You know, that's, a, that's a serious. Maybe some people here grew up in serious situations. These guys, uh, you know, you, you had to, did you go in the army? Yeah, they had to go in the Israeli army, you know? Who knows where other people grew up, you know? I grew up in, I'm sorry, fat city for a white American, you know? That's a, I just had a big question, but Sung San Sanim and, and a lot of older Koreans and a lot, some, maybe some of you grew up in not so good situation. Uh, do it is much better, and with Sung San Sanim, his teaching was, even the theoretical, was all pointed to how apply this in your life. That's the most important. Okay, so forget about the sutras. In 20 years, no problem, read them. We'll direct you to some of the teachings that are really beneficial, that will help you get it for yourself. If you don't know how to drive, reading a, you know, the Indy 500 uh, a, a driver's manual of how to handle a spin at 250 miles an hour isn't going to help you. <laughs> First learn to drive the car. Okay. <laughs> Other questions? Any kind of question? Yes, the man over there. <laughs> Um, we have a teaching where we ask them, um, why do you eat? And we say, I eat, I eat for beans, I walk for beans, do things for beans. And then, then we also have kind of teaching of, when you do something, just do it. And then I eat just for the sake of eating, walk just for the sake of walking. And I was wondering if you can kind of talk about how those things somewhat maybe contradict. You know, do I eat just for eating, or do I eat for like, a reason for beans? Um, any language is just pointing. Okay, what do they call T in Hebrew? Okay, that's no good. Okay, water. Okay, English is water. Korean, mool. Korean Chinese, su. What's Chinese Chinese? Sweet. Sweet. And, and Malay is I, right? I. Bo yeah, bahasa. Yeah. And uh, Hebrew is what? Mine. Yeah, so they're all different words. They're all pointing to the same thing. So. Uh, why do you eat every day? When you're doing something, just do it. Only go straight, don't know. Don't make anything. Put it all down. They're all pointing to the same point. But in certain situations, you use this question or this or this or this. Now, just do it. All these teaching words, which Sun carefully came up with, probably originally from the Chinese and the Korean, and he'd find a way he wanted to say it in English, you know, short, straight, they're tricky because you have to be careful about how you use them. Like, just do it. Uh, one time, uh, some Koreans, uh, doctors in New York City, they built, bought a five-story building, and uh, we were going to turn it into a, uh, a Zen center and a Korean temple. And Sung San Sanim sent myself, and I wasn't a monk at the time, and a monk, American monk, uh, down there to uh, rebuild the second floor and later the fourth floor. And it had been a business, so our job was to tear down all the walls 
And it was fun, you know, wrecking things is fun, especially when you're like 29, you know. We had big, long crowbars and we just smashing walls. And every night we would sweep a space and lay out a carpet and sleep in uh, sleeping bags, get up early in the morning, do 108 bows, chanting and uh, sitting. And eventually we tore down everything. Even the toilet was just exposed to the whole long room. It was about as long as this room, about this size, even longer, I think. And it was divided into the separate offices and out of bathroom. We tore the whole thing out. We had a great time. And there was a big uh, heating unit and it was too heavy to move. So we took off the outside and inside was gold colored fiberglass. And when there was a restaurant on the first floor, and when we ripped off the outside, it was full of cockroaches, and they all headed to the walls, and they were gold color from eating the fiberglass. And I was like, whoa, insects are amazing, you know. I had read that some insect, there was an insecticide in the 50s or 60s in America to kill these insects. And somehow, at some point, they figured out not only how to survive it, but to reproduce the chemical inside and use that against their enemies. So one day I was thinking, okay, the reptiles were the big dominant on Earth, and then the mammals came, and you know, we're probably gonna destroy the planet for mammals, so maybe insects will be next. So be nice to insects. <laughs> You know, I don't even kill Ginnies. You know, if you haven't met a Ginne, it's red and it has a million legs and it has a nasty bite. You know, it's a long, thin thing and very fast. I catch them in my room and take them out in the forest and like, have a good time, but stay away from the building. <laughs> so, you know, like Sung San Sim said, when you're practicing, everything becomes interesting. And when I first heard that, I said, that sounds great. And then one day I thought, he didn't say everything becomes wonderful. <laughs> he said it becomes interesting, which means, of course, if you're willing to face your suffering, it's suffering, but it also has something interesting about it. Like, why is this happening? Not just like, why is it happening to me? You know. But uh, trying to get back to your question. Okay, so all these teachings have the same point but you've got to learn how to apply it. So this monk and I are tearing down this place and there's this kind of plaster wall and I'm on one side with this long crowbar made out of metal with a hook and like would smash it into the wall and rip it open and tear it apart. Yesterday, Bo Poissonim and I were in Seoul and across the street, a small quiet street, there was a group of guys tearing apart the inside of some office. And they had a pile of junk on the ground and the young guys were putting it into a truck and the older guy who looked like the boss had this cabinet and we stopped to watch him. He was having the greatest time tearing apart this cabinet, you know? And he like somehow, it wasn't very well made, so he rips off the top and the young guys are just watching and he pulls part of it out and then he takes part of it and smashes the rest and he takes the drawers and he throws them at the ground and they all break apart and everything. And he's having a great time and I said, that's how that guys enjoy that. They enjoy ripping things apart, you know? And look who's doing it, the older guy. The young guys don't get the fun. They have to pick up the pieces and throw them in the truck. And then I told her about how I had a job like that once and I had a great time with this uh, old black guy. And we, were, we had to clean out a whole warehouse, five stories. And the first story, we had to save some of the stuff. And the second also, so we had to be careful. But the third floor, there was this big elevator shaft, and really big, and it just, it, it just had a flat thing for moving boxes up and down. And so on the third floor, we could throw out everything. So we just shove them onto this thing and take it down. But the fourth floor, I don't know if it was his idea or my idea, why put it on the, the lift? Why not just push it down the shaft? <laughs> and it would smash on the ground. 
And I had the best time those two days, just shoving everything into this big hall and letting it smash down below. But anyway, that's the, you know, the pleasures of youth. But so anyway, so we're going like this. And suddenly, from the other side, this monk's iron bar comes through the wall like that, right next to my head. And I said, watch out, I'm on the other side. And I hear him shout, just do it! And it came through again. And of course, if I had uh, been like I am now, I would have gone around and punched him and say, just do it! You know? <laughs> but I was a little more respectful or something, or, or uh, afraid. <laughs> so you have to learn how to apply these teachings, OK? Why do you eat every day is teaching us what is our correct direction, OK? How do it, just do it. Now the thing about just do it is, sometimes you just do really stupid things, but you get cause and effect clearly. You may get a bad result, but you know it for sure. Rather than, you know, should I do it, shouldn't I do it, should I do it, shouldn't I do it, should I do it, shouldn't I do it. You think, oh, Sung San Sinim says, just do it. You just do it, and you got a problem. One time when I was with this Korean uh, teacher, and we were at her temple in Hawaii, one of her students asked her, um, you know, sometimes I just want to hit my friend. And the teacher said, do it. And then the student was like, really? And then the teacher said, but you better be ready for what comes next. <laughs> So, of course, Santanim, I think he never told people, you know, just hit him. No. But um, uh, the point is, what I realized from that is, yeah, you can just do whatever. If it's coming from I want, cause and effect will teach you something. If it's coming from uh, before thinking all beings, if your direction is very strong for all beings, then you, it may well work work well. But even Sung San Sinim, who would shout at some students, he only hit people who really believed in him. In fact, he told me once, he said, uh, hit a man sometimes necessary, then they believe you. Woman, different style of teaching. <laughs> and he said, but only hit somebody who believes you 100%. If they don't believe you 100%, then next time more don't believe you. So, yeah, all these teachings are correct. How apply it, very important. Okay? Long answer, lots of digressions, or, you know, that's my style. Any questions? Other questions? <clears throat> it's just such a great opportunity in coming back from Seoul. I just feel like the energy is kind of settled here. Even if inside you're in some turmoil, definitely the effect of try, try, try is very good and very positive. So I hope everybody keeps a sincere mind and keeps trying. You know, we say with sitting practice, three things are important. Uh, body, breathing, and mind. So you all understand body. Uh, when you have to, you use a chair, and there's different leg positions. Most important is that it be balanced in some way. That's fine, this is fine. You know, half lotus, full lotus is fine. You don't want to have one leg in front and the other twisted over here. Sometimes uh, people sit that way when they talk, but that is not good for your hips uh, for sitting meditation. It's not balanced. Um, so you know body position, hands in, this mudra uh, against your body. Uh, I put my thumbs uh, right at the navel, and that kind of centers the mudra on your uh, Korean, say, tanjan or Chinese dantian. And uh, Sung San Sini called that holding the universe in the palms of your hand. You know? And uh, uh, very important, breathing. Oh, also, you want to tuck your chin slightly. That helps your spine be straighter in the neck. Try to relax your shoulders and elbows and so forth. And uh, breathing is, is very important. 
Uh, first, just be aware of your breath uh, without doing anything. And then um, our style is imagine that when you breathe in, the air goes, all, the, the breath goes all the way down to your lower belly, about two centimeters below your navel. That's uh, in, in uh, uh, Northeast Asia, considered the body's energy center. And uh, you can relax your belly. It can even come out as you breathe in. Uh, when you breathe out, more important is your out breath. You a little bit pull your lower belly in. Keep your attention in this lower belly area, but you can feel the air come out. And try to make the exhale longer than the inhale. Don't try to keep it all like five seconds in, 10 seconds out, five seconds in, 10 seconds out. It has its own, uh, you know if you try yourself, sometimes you need a longer big breath and sometimes a shorter exhale. But basically, uh, put a little attention into making a longer exhale than usual. And this lower belly breathing has many physiological benefits and uh, mind benefits because it helps bring your energy down. And so uh, try that, work with that. I taught Sun Yu last week. Maybe we'll do it again sometime soon. It's some uh, breathing movements based on this uh, lower belly breathing. Uh, just some things like this, which you don't do during sitting, but um, uh, some people like that and find it useful to use on the breaks. And then mind. Mind is having curiosity about what, what, is, what, I, what is this thing I call I? You know, it's just having curiosity about it. And I think that almost all children, when we're around nine or ten, and maybe you can remember this, for a moment you think about, what, what is this? You know, like world, life, what is that? What is that? I don't know if animals think about that. You know, it's like at some time an animal is like, what's going on here? You know, it's like, how come I, I got this? You know, I don't, I don't know if animals think about that. But humans definitely do. You know, we get some question. We, there's something about us that can, that has this wider sense of what, what's going on. And um, often, uh, also, as teenagers, sometimes we'll have that. And then as adults, we may come back to it again. And that's the heart of Zen practice of like, what is this? What am I? What is life and death? You know, uh, that's what you run into. And of course, we can get into the circumstances of life, which is fine, a careers or a love relationship or a family. Uh, things like that, and that's not a, a hindrance, um, especially if we also uh, give attention to this question. And uh, we know Sung Santini, the majority, the vast majority of his students are lay people, the and the majority of the people he made teachers are lay people. So he understood that this practice is independent of being a sinim, of being a lay person, and he taught that way, and he honored that. And then some people, we had the karma to feel like, oh, the way I want to deal with impermanence and suffering and non-self and blah, 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 my karma is to be a sinim. And uh, many people, thought, my younger brother, if he was a sinim, he'd be such a boring, bored person, you know. He was really, he's great as, uh, you know, having a partner, having two kids, having a profession. That's his dharma, you know. So there's, it's, there's no better or worse. It's like, what is the way that you choose to deal with this? And all of it, any of it, if we practice, can turn into wisdom and compassion because that's our original nature. You know, and it's wonderful in this modern world to have a teacher like Sung San Sinim who absolutely, completely understood that, you know, uh, and had no hindrance uh, working with everybody and, you know, helping them along. <laughs> and uh, uh, so this, being curious 
about this? Am I my body? Am I my thinking, my emotions? And being aware of what's appearing. You know, I hate this person next to me. Did you ever talk to them? No. I don't know who they are, but it's this and this. <laughs> you know? This stuff just appears on its own, you know? But being aware of what appears and appears and appears. And then there's a very many ways to uh, work with that. And it's all just created habitual thinking. And our body also uh, has its habits that are rooted in some idea. I was just wondering why sometimes we can ask ourselves a question and an answer will arise, but other times not. Well, even if an answer arises, our teaching is don't know. If you don't keep don't know, the next moment will be a problem. You know? Um, uh, I always thought that Zen Master Sung San was the Zen Master in our school because he had the biggest don't know mind. And he was willing to go into situations that culturally he was completely unfamiliar with and uh, begin to understand us by having an open mind that didn't know. You know? And uh, so, who cares about the answers? I don't find that the most important thing. Yeah, sometimes in Kongans we get excited when an answer appears, but it's the um, confidence and comfort with don't know mind that's the most important. So rather than, oh, I got an answer to my problem, to me, in my life, in terms of really life situations, It's not even like an answer appears. It just becomes so incredibly obvious <laughs> what to do next. You know, <laughs> there's no question about it. But I had to, you know, you have to go through a lot of suffering sometime to get to that. <laughs> and the only way you go through the suffering is you, you keep wondering what is going on here. That's all. So anyway, uh, yeah. As in just now you talk about sitting. Sitting? Yeah. I, I wonder like, how you do uh, during if chanting. Like. The same thing. Yeah. Actually, during chanting, it's much easier to see your thinking, isn't it? Yeah. You know, during sitting, you can, oh, I feel so clear because you're attached to a feeling, you know? But in chanting, it's very clear. You're doing the chant or you're not, right? And you can chant and still think something else. <laughs> That's what always blows my mind, you know. <laughs> you know, and here's the something. You know, recently we changed that word in the English Heart Sutra, perverted to deluded. Well, I've been doing that for 45 years. It's so deep in there. If I don't really keep attention, then it just comes out pervert. That's why I read it every time now. <laughs> And it's fun actually reading. It's like, whoa, that's what it says. <laughs> <You know? laughs> because I can do that in my sleep. It's, you know, two times a day, 45 years. It's like, <laughs> you know. So in some ways, once you know the chant, it's even harder to pay attention. <laughs> because part of your brain can chant even while you're thinking something else. <laughs> woo! So you have to take that thinking energy and gently or strongly put that attention more into the chant. I think of it as like a laser. You know, what a laser is, is very focused light. That's what gives it power. So if you have some um, ability to control your attention, you know, and you have a correct direction, want to become clear and help others, you know, some people, they can control their uh, attention, but they always put it into how can I dominate you? That's not so wonderful, you know? Um, but if you have this direction that you've built up over time of really trying to become clear uh, and for, for yourself and others to be able to do worthwhile, beneficial actions in the world, then uh, you need to get what we call strong center, which means some ability to control your attention. And you can see when you're chanting, 
you know, that sometimes, lots of times, our, chant, our attention is split in different directions, you know. Part of it is chanting, but part of it's thinking something else. Maybe you're thinking about, oh, my hip hurts, or the wings, the fan's too strong, or I don't like this person's voice, or look at that person. You know, it's like oh, the whole range appears. Then, instead of like, that's true, and I, I like complaining about other people, take that energy and put it more into the chant. So just imagine that you're taking this diverse, ability to be aware and kind of channeling it. And then what happens as your direction gets more refined, you pick up what's important. You know, I think our clear mind is functioning 24 hours a day. It's never off. But we are, we um, have uh, gummed up the works. You know, some Sanson used to say, this is the best computer in the world but it's got a lot of dust, desire, anger, and ignorance, so it often doesn't function so well. So he would say, we use don't know soap, clean our consciousness, and then it functions well, which means it picks up what's important. You can give examples of that, you know. <clears throat> One time, uh, there was an experiment they did with cats many, many years ago in the 60s. And they put some implants in the cat's head and then they'd make it uh, pretty hungry and they'd stick a metronome in the cage and tick, 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 tick. And they could tell they're getting electrical impulses from some part of the brain where it's picking up this tick, 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 tick. But then they'd get the cat really hungry and put a mouse in a glass jar in the cage and the cat see the mouse and what was important to the cat was food. They didn't get the signal anymore here, even though the metronome was still there. That's attention. That's the power of attention. Okay? And if don't know mind means that ability to be attentive spreads out all over the whole brain. So meditation basically means everything becomes one. And then as your direction becomes clear, you pick up what's important, which is what causes suffering, how overcome it. It's just the natural functioning of things. But we can't make a plan, but we can practice. And that's why we have Dharma talks and interviews and occasionally the teacher, you know, it's like if you're learning tennis, you know, the teacher says, well, when the ball comes like this, turn your shoulders this way and they tell you all this stuff to do. But you have to do it a lot, like a lot. And then you start to be able to do it and then the teacher watches you do it. You know, no, you're still keeping your shoulders like this, a little like this. Yeah, I, I, I was no good at tennis, but I remember learning. You know, something they would tell us, you hold the racket so that this thing here is in the V of your hand. And then when you do a backhand, you shift it, you know. I don't know how they do it now, because people started to do the double backhand and stuff. But, you know, you get some instruction. So somebody comes and the teacher is, why you eat every day? And somebody else comes, and when you're eating, just eat. <laughs> Depends where the person's stuck. Yeah. So chanting, chanting's a, often a, a faster a way to uh, focus than sitting. It's just another thing to work on. I like the way Sung Sansani made us do all three things every day bowing, chanting, sitting. Some people would come, sitting was their thing, they didn't like chanting, you know. In fact, one Zen center wanted to cut out chanting in the beginning. It was before I came. They made a Zen center in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and I heard the story. Sun Sanin went up there one day, and they said, Sun Sanin, Zen is sitting, not chanting. We don't want to chant. And he said, no, no, no. Zen means when you're doing something, just do it. So sitting time, sit. Chanting time, chant. Yeah, but uh, chanting's not Zen. You know, they picked up some idea, maybe from the Japanese or something. And he said, we only want to sit. And he said, okay, then this is your Zen center. I'm not come here. Then some of them said, no, we want you to be our teacher. And he said, well, if you want me to be your teacher, then follow my teaching. 
<laughs> but some people only wanted chanting and bowing, some action. But Santinim also made us sit. And then what was lovely is to see over time, everybody could appreciate all of it. Kwan Hang Sinim, I love it, you know, he's a real sitter. He did 200 day solo retreats just sitting. Then somebody convinced him to do 100 day chanting. And they were doing like eight hours a day. He, he was in the winter in the Buddha hall, you know. His Konglan practice totally opened up. He was very simple. So any Konglan I'd ask him, he'd come in, only that, don't know. <laughs> If he had an answer, he gave it. But if he didn't know, he was also quite proud about that. Don't know. <laughs> he, not like most of us who, oh, I wish I had an answer. I only don't, I only don't know. <laughs> you know? But he was like, don't know. <laughs> like, that's what I got. But he started to give these great answers that were even better than what I was looking for. So just respond, you know. If you don't know, okay, don't know. That's cool. When you die, you're going to know what's going to happen next? No. You may make something up in your mind. Oh, I'm going to the pure land or oh, I'm going to hell. You know, you make something up in your mind, but truthfully, you don't know. <laughs> you don't know where you're going. <laughs> if you like, don't know. Okay, let's see what this is. You know, when you're falling, die. So, um, all that aside, uh, only go straight, don't know. When you're doing something, just do it. <laughs>